So when I was in college, I had to take a humanities class. And I'm going to be honest with you, when I signed up for it because it was a prerequisite, I thought it was going to be like biology, like about humans. Turns out that's not at all what it's about. Um, I had to go like look at art and stuff and learn about artists. And so one of the assignments was I had to go to the art museum. And it was one of the most confusing experiences of my life because I expected to see the greatest works of art that existed on earth. And what I found was splashes of paint randomly put on canvas and then they framed it and put a light on it. And people fell for it. People would stand around and they'd look at this and they'd argue about what it was and what it wasn't, what it meant and what it didn't meant and how it was better than other things and not as good as other things. And there were tears and all sorts of things. And I just remember thinking like my, my two-year-old could have painted that. And that's really how it all works. It's, it's presentation over product. Like if you put a gold frame on a kindergartner's work, something like this, like if we alone, you're like, that's nice, honey, thank you, where can I put this? But the second you put a gold frame on it, oh, it's a work of art. And then you might hang it on a special place in your house, and again, you put a little light on it, and people walk in and they go, where did you get that, and how much did you pay? And the frame makes all the difference, and it's the same thing in the art museum. The, the way things are framed and presented elevates whatever it is to something other than maybe what it is. And this happens in a lot of different places in our life, but I'm going to make the argument today that it's no more true than in places like our families. Uh, when we look back on our families and how we grew up and where we came from, the frame that we choose to put on it, the way that we present it, makes all the difference. Because you're the one telling the story. And you get to decide how that story sounds. You get to decide what the circumstances and events in your life mean to you. A lot of us live most of our lives feeling like we're victims, like we're stuck in this repeating cycle that we're doomed to repeat. But the truth is, we live in this present moment and we're able to look back and go, it can mean something different. I, I've shared this maybe before, that I grew up in what most would consider a pretty strict household. There were rules and we didn't break the rules and there was punishment if you did. And I lived in a great house. I have no issues with my parents at all. Like we're, we're all good. But the rules were intense. And if I've said this part before, forgive me, I'm going to repeat it. I had a curfew of midnight when I was 21 years old and engaged to be married. <laughs> yeah. A lot of rules. But what was interesting was my dad sat me down one day and he goes, let me explain to you why this is my expectation. I have to get up at three o'clock in the morning to go to work. And if you're rolling in here at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, you're gonna wake me up and I'm not gonna go back to sleep and I'm not gonna be able to do my best at work. And that wedding you want some financial help with, good luck, because I won't have a job to pay for it anymore because I won't be doing my best, right? He, he connected the dots for me to help me understand what that rule meant. He framed it for me. And now when I look back on that, I'm grateful for the rules I grew up with because those rules taught me how to be a disciplined person. They taught me how to think about tomorrow while I'm behaving today and that tomorrow might be affected by today. But that's my choice to see it that way. I, I could see it entirely different. And you have things with your mom, with your dad, your siblings, your grandparents, your neighborhood, all of that, where when you're telling the story, you get to decide what the story means. You get to choose the frame that you put on it. And sometimes we need to pause long enough to go, I can put this on there so it actually has some good meaning in my life. Reality is our families don't define us, we define them. For too long, we've accepted that 
Our parents are the definition of who we are. And their parents were the definition of who they are. And back and back and back and back. And our last name is like a seal on the story of our life. And it's, it's just a destiny kind of thing. We can't help ourselves. But the reality is, you can decide what that's really about. And where is it taking you into the future? And all of this series, we've been looking at the royal family of Israel and this dynamic plays out in, in a great way in the life of King David. And King David, we met week one. If you remember, if you haven't been here with us uh, and you're like, I'm not sure where we're at in this, just jump back. You can watch it all online and, and catch up. But King David was, was chosen by God to be the king of Israel. And before he became the king, he was the one that killed the giant, remember, and Saul got mad at him, who was the people's first king. And it was just kind of a mess. And th this family continues to be the world's greatest soap opera of all time. Like if you, if you watched the show Dallas uh, back in the day, they got nothing on David and his children uh, because it is such a fascinating thing. In fact, David had about, depending on how you count, 19 to 21 children. I'm gonna say that again. 19 to 21 children. You thought your grocery bill was high. I mean, how do you feed all those people and keep track of all of those people? And well, it turns out it was really difficult even for King David, who by the way, was kind of a celebrity king. Everybody loved him because of the story he brought to the table and the story he was leading the nation through. They, they were kind of seen as an established and, and great nation now at, in this point in history. So everybody loves David except maybe his kids. Because David was really like every other dad, misunderstood, misrepresented, and defined differently than he would have wanted. If you are a father or you have a father, which means all of us in this room, if you were to write out the profile of your dad or your kids were to do that of you and you read it, you might be horrified. Or if your parents read it, they might be horrified. That's not who I am, but that's who you perceived them to be or who your kids perceive you to be. And while it's not explicit in scripture, I just have to believe David's like every other dad. And with 19 to 21 children, somebody's gonna think you're not so great. One of them is named Absalom, who we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today. But Absalom is one of actually three kids that I want to discuss for a minute. Amnon is the oldest son of David, and he is not a full sibling of Absalom and Tamar. This, this is where you realize the family tree of the king of Israel is not really a tree. It's more of a bush. It's, um, it's complicated. So Amnon is oldest, Absalom is his half-brother, but Tamar is Absalom's full sister, Amnon's half-sister. And, and here's where it gets really, really messed up. And if you've ever wondered, like, Josh, why do you, why do you trust the Bible that it actually points us to something? And here's my simplest answer, because it, it didn't get edited. <laughs> they kept all the messy, messed up parts in there, and if you were making the whole thing up, I mean, think of the stories you tell. When you tell about the big fish that you caught on your fishing trip, you don't tell them it took you 43 hours to catch that one fish, right? You leave out the parts that aren't going to make the story great. The scriptures, they kept all of this in. And so here's what happens. The, the oldest son, Amnon, he falls in love with Tamar, his half-sister. You're like, that's messed up. I know. I told you, if you're, if you're bored reading the Bible, you're reading the wrong parts. Uh, Amnon falls in love with Tamar. And Amnon is best friends with a guy who's actually his cousin. And his cousin helps him hatch a plan to get alone with Tamar. And here's what's crazy. Amnon rapes Tamar. Rapes his own half-sister. Now you can imagine how this sat with everybody. Of course, Dad is furious, but nobody's more angry than Tamar's full sibling, Absalom. And Absalom decides there needs to be vengeance for this act. We can't let this stand. This can't go unpunished. He did something awful, and he has disgraced our name. He's disgraced my sister, and there will be consequences. And so for two years, Absalom plots 
how he will avenge his sister. And it comes out and uh, we're going to have a big sibling party. And what happens at this party is that Amnon dies at the hands of Absalom. This didn't go over with dad very well, which might be surprising because dad's probably still mad about Amnon doing what he did and he's still trying to console his daughter and then he's got this other son that's killing his other son. Again, it is messed up. Family is super complicated. And I hope that yours is not as complicated as David's. And what happens next is Absalom, after Amnon is killed, he runs to grandpa's house, which is what all good kids do when they're in trouble with mom and dad. They go find grandma and grandpa because grandma and grandpa will protect them. Um, To this day, if you sit down with my dad, he'd go, I knew I could never punish you at grandma's house uh, because she would yell at me. And here's what I told my dad last time we had this conversation. I knew that. (laughs) <laughs> oh, which is why I did some of the things I did, because grandma would protect me. So Absalom runs out to grandpa's house and lives out that way for three years. Has no contact with David, no contact with his family. He's basically been ostracized and left. At the end of that three-year period, though, he starts to have these feelings of wanting to go home and wanting to be reconciled with dad. So dad invites Absalom to come back But he doesn't bring him all the way back like he was before. He brings him sort of back. And this is what he says. Absalom can come back home, but he can't come into my presence. He's not allowed to talk to me. He's not allowed to see me, and I don't want to see him. And that goes on for two years. And here's why this is meaningful to me. Some of you, that's where you're at with your parents. Some of you, that's where you're at with your kids. There's distance. There's a lack of communication. There's misunderstandings and miscommunications. Because think about what likely was going on in that five-year period, whether it was when Absalom was out with Grandpa or he had moved back into town. Absalom's thinking, my dad hates me. My dad probably wants to have me killed. He thinks I'm a failure. He's not fair because he's not taking into account what Amnon did to Tamar. I was just doing the right thing. He's taking sides. He's choosing his other kids over me. Is this the story David's telling? No. Is it the one that Absalom is telling about David? Yes. And to be fair, there might be stories David's telling about Absalom that aren't right. He is a failure, or he hates me and wanted to ruin my good name by doing what he did. He doesn't want to talk to me. He doesn't want to have anything to do with our family. This is what happens when there's a gap between our expectations and our experience. We start filling it with things that make sense of it for us. And so, rest assured, that's going on with David and Absalom. Again, not spelled out in Scripture, but these are real people in a real family with real issues. And at the end of those two years, so five years after the incident, David finally decides to reconcile with Absalom. And this is what we read. At last, David summoned Absalom, who came and bowed low before the king, and the king kissed him. I don't want to jump too far into this without pausing a minute and and reminding us it took a long time for these two to come back together. Family is often measured in years. And that's good for us to hear. Because again, if you're in that place where there's distance and there's brokenness between you and family, our our tendency is to want to rush it. Our tendency is to want to make it happen now. We got to fix this now, especially as good Christians, right? If you're a Christian in the room, you're like, this is not okay. Honor your father and mother. I got to figure it out. And if you're not a Christian, and that's totally great, we're glad that you're here and, and that you're allowing us to be part of your week, but even for you, there's, this, there's probably this part of you that's like, if this doesn't get fixed, it's never going to get fixed. And I imagine that Absalom probably thought that at about year three, 
If we don't get this fixed, it's never going to get fixed. And it was two whole years after that that it finally did. And what's interesting is time has a funny way of changing our perspective, doesn't it? You can start to think about things differently and see things differently. For David, it was enough time where the sting of his oldest son being killed by his other son started to wane. For Absalom, it was maybe fury over a lack of action from his father that he felt necessitated his to finally wane, where they could come together and see each other and understand each other a little bit better. I think of it like this. When I, we used to go to book, bookstores back in the 1900s, um, and I was a kid, I would go to one place in the bookstore. I'd find the Magic Eye book. Do you remember these? Uh, Magic Eye books were the best. In case you're not familiar with them, um, this, and this is probably if you're like a teenager or young 20s, we would go get these books, and they had these weird designs in them that didn't look like anything. And here's how you had to do it. You would take the book, and you'd cross your eyes like this, and you'd pull it in really close, and then slowly pull it away, and people were always barking like coaching tips at you, like, look through the book, look through the book. And you pull it out, and all of a sudden, boom, there's a three-dimensional image uh, coming out of the book at you that you didn't see at first, but you looked at it long enough that it finally appeared. You were seeing something that you weren't seeing before. And it's not because the book changed. It's not because you turned the page. It's not because it's not you were looking at something different. It's just because you looked at that thing long enough. Sometimes it's not about time. Sometimes it's about angle, which reminds me of the Picasso down in Chicago. Have you ever seen the Picasso, most of us are like, it's such a weird bird pig thing um, that's in the middle of the city. But in the humanities class, we had to go on a trip down to the city to see architecture and the art museum and all this. And we went to the Picasso and it was maybe the second time I'd ever seen it. And I'm like, why are we making, why, I mean, why are we staring at this thing? It's so ugly. Um, until my professor said, we're looking at it from the wrong angle. Most people look at it from the front. What you may not know is this is actually a sculpture of a beautiful woman's profile. You can't see it, though, when you stand in the front. You actually have to go behind it and look at a certain angle, and all of a sudden, you understand why it's there. This is true of family. It was true of David and Absalom. It took time to look at their situation long enough and from all of the different angles before they could come together and be reconciled. And everybody was really excited and it was great. And they should have been, but you know how family is. It gets good for a while and then it gets bad again, which is kind of what happens with Absalom next. He gets back into town, he's back under the name of the king, and by the way, he was known as the most handsome of David's sons, so he was very popular, and he had beautiful hair, and he hired all of these bodyguards, and that's how he'd go around town, and everybody knew who he was. And something started to switch in Absalom's heart, and I think it was the way he was framing his dad. Initially, he maybe framed his dad as inactive, not going to avenge his, his sister, who then he avenged. Then it became reconciled dad, forgiveness dad. And then when Absalom starts to do what he did, maybe he started to frame his dad as not enough king. This is what we read. Absalom got up early every morning and went out to the gate of the city. Again, this is years after the whole incident. When people brought a case to the king for judgment, Absalom would ask where in Israel they were from, and they would tell him their tribe. Then Absalom would say, you've really got a strong case here. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it. Sounds like my 11-year-old at Target. <laughs> I wish I were the judge. Then everyone would bring their cases to me for judgment, and I would give them justice. Here's what's in between the words he actually says. My dad won't. My dad's too busy doing king stuff to actually help the people he's the king of. 
You feel the frame starting to shift? And when he says, it's too bad the king doesn't have anybody, I could do it. Again, like my 11-year-old at Target, it's too bad I don't have this action figure. What's he saying? Will you buy me this action figure? Absalom's maybe saying to the people, will you accept, accept me as your judge? I could do this, and I might actually do it better. See, what's happening is he's taking David out of the frame altogether and inserting himself. And he says, I, I might be a better king than my dad. And some of us have spent a long portion of our life trying to be better whatevers than our parents. Better parents, better executives, better business owners, better homemakers, better neighbors. There's this thing that's kind of built into us where we want to exceed our parents all the time. We want to get out from their shadow and become the shadow. And I think that's what's happening with Absalom. He's starting to go, I, I could sit on the throne and I could do better than my dad who's so loved and so revered and maybe I would be even more. And the way he does what he does only accentuates this thinking. This is what we read. When people tried to bow before him, Absalom wouldn't let them. Instead, he took them by the hand and kissed them. Absalom did this with everyone who came to the king for judgment. And so he stole the hearts of all the people of Israel. This is like the peer pressure part of our lives, right? When, when our friends start saying what we're hoping they would say, when our friends start believing about us what we want them to believe about us, it's easier to start acting based on that belief. It could go like this. When people start liking the frame we're putting on our family, when that goes in line with how other people are framing their family, it's easier to make it a permanent frame. And that's what happens with Absalom. He starts moving over time. This goes on for about four years where people are loving him and he's being the judge and it moves from I could be to I should be. These are those little small things that happen in our hearts and our minds that can radically shift the family dynamic. And when we start getting prideful and selfish and all of those kinds of things, it's so easy to take the picture of our family off the wall pull it out and put something else on because we want to make sense of what we're feeling. We want to make sense of where we think we're headed. And so we need that to change. And what happens with Absalom is it moves from reconciliation to rebellion because he wanted recognition. He wanted to be seen as the king instead of dad. So this is what he does next. After four years of being loved and being the judge. But while he was there, he sent secret messengers to all the tribes of Israel to stir up a rebellion against the king. Now he's going to go against his own father. As soon as you hear the ram's horn, this message, his message read, you are to say Absalom has been crowned king in Hebron. And this is kind of how it goes. And messengers get to David in town and, and they say, you got to get out of here. Absalom's bringing a whole army with him. This is going to be bad. We're going to be slaughtered. We got to get you to safety. So David runs and he spends quite a bit of time running from his son, not unlike the way he had to run from Saul when he was younger. And there's all this unrest in the kingdom because the king and his family had unrest and isn't that how it plays out where we have unrest in our family and everything else in the life seems to have unrest? Your job's affected by it. Your ability to relax and watch TV is affected by it. What you look at on the internet is affected by it. Where you go and spend your time is affected by it because when that place is not right, nothing is right. So the kingdom's in upheaval. What happens is David, who forever had been framed in a beautiful frame and seen as God's guy, 
He was God's gift to Israel. He was the man after God's own heart. He had taken us from this obscure, kind of messed up nation into a solidified and significant one. And because of Absalom and the story Absalom is not only telling himself, but everyone else, the frame shifts to be a little more ominous and a little more scary. And maybe David isn't as for us as we thought he is. You know, he doesn't show up at the gate to, offer, to help us figure out our problems. He's too busy in the palace all the time. And that story gets shared and shared, and you know how that goes. It ends up getting twisted and twisted until David's ultimately seen as the enemy. Not the one that saved Israel. And despite the story that was already there, the history, the facts that were already there, people believed an entirely different narrative because they framed it different. They dressed it up different. It was presented different. So all of a sudden, the product was understood different. As the story goes, there is battle after battle, but the last one is in this very interesting, it says heavily wooded area. And Absalom, David's you know, most handsome son, is riding on his horse. And as you ride on a horse, I don't know if you've ever done this, I've done it like once, and I don't have long hair, so I wouldn't know, but your hair flies up like this, and Absalom's hair flies up like this and gets tangled in a tree branch. You're like, this sounds like something in a fairy tale. I know, but it's real. Um, it gets tangled in a tree branch, and the horse runs off, and he's hanging there by his hair. And wouldn't you know, David's men come walking up. And wouldn't you know, they'd go, thanks, God, and they kill him. They killed David's son, the rebel king. And why this part becomes so important is because what David shows us next is the power of a frame and the power of a story. Because when the men come to report to David that his enemy, who was also his son, is now dead, it would have been easy for David to celebrate. I've conquered another enemy. I've preserved my throne. I've vanquished the evil in my kingdom. But he refuses to reframe his son from anything other than his son. The king was overcome with emotion. He went up to the room over the gateway and burst into tears. And as he went, he cried, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. I mean, that's a huge statement. David would rather that he have died than his son, who had brought so much shame and dishonor and pain to David. Because David always held his children in a beautiful frame on a beautiful wall. And he acted and loved and interacted with them based on that which was different than what often their actions were. That's the power of a frame. And here's how it applies to our families. We all have things in our lives, people in our lives, pain in our lives, brokenness in our lives that we wish wasn't there. But we also have the ability to frame it in such a way, define it in such a way, and understand it where it plays out differently in our present day. David's response was not based on Absalom. It was based on David. Absalom didn't frame Absalom. David did. David was the one left to tell the story. And I have to believe that when he sits Solomon down one day, who would become the king, or he sits down with his advisors or the other people in the city, it was never about Absalom and his brokenness or his rebellion or his murder of his son. It became, I lost my son. I lost two sons. 
in this. And I'm heartbroken over that. And maybe, just maybe, David would sit down with Solomon and go, here's some things that your brother did and some things that your brother believed that I'm going to encourage you to believe and do different. To save you the pain that he endured. To save you the confusion that he had to suffer through. What David shows us And in a lot of ways, what Absalom shows us is that our families don't define us, we define them. I know that we are tempted so often to believe that we are the victim of our circumstances when it comes to our families. And to some degree we are. I'm I'm not pretending that there aren't things that have happened for some of us in our families where we were not a victim. But when we live a victimized life, we sometimes need to be reminded that we can reframe. And sometimes the reframing is not what my parents were or my grandparents were or uncles and aunts were was awesome, but what it showed me was what I don't want to be in the future. And in that is the blessing. I learned where I don't want to go. And some of us were blessed. I'm one of them. I learned a lot about where I do want to go and who I do want to be. But it comes down to how do I look back on it and how do I frame it and define it. So I'm going to encourage you to practice something that I will warn you is not easy and may not be fun, but might be really necessary. And it's not journaling, men. It's going to sound like journaling, but it's actually just using your phone a little more often. On all of our phones, we have a notes app. Uh, If you have an iPhone, it looks like this. I'm not sure what it looks like on Android, but I promise you have one. And I'm going to encourage you to start a new note that just you title definitions or frames. And here's the good news. Because what you will put in this note might be raw and vulnerable and something you don't want other people to read, All of these apps have password protections that you can put on a single note so that nobody else can open it but you. And what I want you to work through is what do the people in your life, your parents, your family, mean to you today? Which is different than what did they do and what did they say or what did they not do. It's what do they mean to you today? And here's here's how you're going to do it. It's really simple. Start with their name. And if you don't call your parents by name, just mom, dad, whatever. And then underneath that, you're just going to give a sentence or two about your experience with them. Here's the memories I have with this person. And then the next chunk is, here's, what, here's how that's impacted my life. So an example, you might say, dad. Dad yelled at me a lot when I bring home bad grades or when I wouldn't do well in the game or X, Y, and Z. That's the experience part. The impact part is then, so it's really hard for me at work to be in meetings with my boss because I'm anticipating my boss is going to have nothing but negative feedback for me. Or I don't pursue the promotion or I don't pursue the opportunity because I'm afraid I'm going to fail and, I, and I'm so used to just being beaten down when, I'm, when I fail. That's the impact. And then the last thing you're going to do is, here's what that means today. And you might have to do really difficult work of finding a positive meaning for that. But even in just naming the impact it's had on you, that might be meaning enough, where you're aware of it now. You thought about it kind of out loud. And when you are aware of something, you usually have the ability to control that something. The beautiful thing is if you can work all the way through to the meaning, that means that that is a means to an end in your life. It's something you can use. And again, even if at the end of the day, it's these are the things I don't want to be true for my kids or my grandkids or or my nieces or my nephews or my friends' kids. And how will you leverage that understanding and that knowledge? How will you frame that? And tell the story going forward. Because again, you can't change the story. You you can't change the history. And you can't change the people. 
but you can change how you frame it and present it and understand it and act around it. Because when Absalom died, in David's heart, it wasn't a rebel that died. It was a loved son. That's what David decided was the case. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, thank you. Thanks for making sure that we could hear the story of David and Absalom and the example that David gave us of a positive framing of his story. Our natural bent might be more Absalom-like where we shape it to fit the narrative we want or that helps us feel better about how we feel. So will you, in the week ahead, months ahead, even years, help us to understand that sometimes it takes time to see it from a different angle and that you do use every part of our lives for the rest of our lives and help us to find the good and all of those little pieces and frame it in a way that honors you, makes you look good for the generation ahead. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.